Okay. Uh, the crystal's light sensitive inside there, and it's very carefully engineered. Now, to build this sort of thing requires knowledge of physics, real knowledge of physics, solid state physics, in fact, and uh, knowledge of engineering. This is not a trivial thing to build. These things are very, very slick, and they've been engineered uh, to a point where they're, they're wonderful in your camera. Okay, uh, but I don't know what it means to, be, to say it's a signal process. I'm, I don't know what that is. Anyhow, uh, but they are amazing devices. It's true. it's true, nobody has to know how it works because that's the way our life is now. You, everybody's carrying around all this stuff, no idea how any of it works. Uh, all right, so telescopes and astronomical instruments. Uh, here is uh, some famous telescopes. Uh, for years, this was the largest telescope in the world. Uh, this is uh, the Hale Telescope uh, in Southern California, uh, the 200-inch telescope. Uh, all of you who live in Southern California, has anybody seen this? All right. That's uh, a telescope. It's outside of uh, San Diego, uh, and it's uh, in the mountains. It's no longer a great site because the growth of the area has uh, given us so much light pollution that it's uh, not as pristine as it was. All right, here's a view of the telescope inside. Uh, all right, it's a little hard to see that. Uh, let me show you some others. All right, now, what does the telescope do? And uh, you've got to remember, a telescope is not to magnify images. We don't magnify images. Instead, we use a telescope as a giant eye to collect the photons to gather as much light as possible to allow study of a faint object. You wanna, you want, it's like your small eye has been replaced by a giant eye. And to produce, the images have to be in really fine detail, but they don't have to be big. They can be small, it doesn't matter. It's just magnification, you can do that on your computer. But it's, don't, don't tell people that they magnified the images, they didn't. Uh, all right, now, um, all right, now, it's important to put the telescope in the right place. Uh, you want it to be in nice weather. You don't want to put it in, in England the way uh, the British uh, astronomers used to do because they, it was too hard for them to travel anywhere, so they just put it in a cloudy, rainy climate. Anybody been to England? You know, it never is sunny. Uh, the sky is never blue. It's always cloudy. It always rains. Anyhow, uh, you want to be in the above most of the atmosphere if you can. You don't want to be absorbed by anything. And uh, you want to have the atmosphere be very stable, very quiet. And you can't ha it doesn't do any good to have the atmosphere jump around at you. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. That's why the telescopes, uh, all the telescopes are on mountaintops. Because on the top of a mountain, uh, the air passing over can be in what's called a laminar flow, and it is not too turbulent, generally. Okay, so uh, light gathering power. Uh, if you look at these three views, uh, this is Orion, Orion's belt. Uh, he, you can see him around here. Here's Orion, the big guy. And here he is with a little more light. All right. Now, how much light does, do you get on a telescope? If you have a telescope that's a small area, like this, and you want to build a bigger one, we'll call this D1, D2. All right? The light gathering power varies. Oh, diameter, this way, diameter. OK, the light gathering power varies as uh, pi d2 or dx, d1 or 2 squared. That's the area of the circle or something. Like that. Is that right? Doesn't matter. OK, so if you want a big telescope, the diameter is big, but the diameter squared is really big. And so you're not. The second, the, in other words, you grow as a second power of the diameter. 
uh, to get a big telescope. This one collects light at a certain rate, much less so than this one collects light. So you're, many times you want light gathering power. The biggest telescope we have right now is the Keck telescope with a diameter of 10 meters. 10 meter telescope is uh, from, uh, who can estimate 10 meters? Uh, I think that's about, it. that's smaller. This is smaller than 10 meters here, okay? About eight meters. All right, so the telescope is giant. It's huge, and not only is the telescope a, a big collection of glass, the glass has to be held to a small fraction of light. A small fraction of the wavelength of light it has to be incredibly stable. And when you tilt the glass, you take a glass and turn it upside, you know, turn it around as is tracking something in the atmosphere, it is very difficult to ensure that, that, the, that the glass hasn't bent. It's very hard to find material that's stiff enough that doesn't deform when it's, it's placed in a different gravity load. So the stiffness, building the stiffness behind the mirror is a very fine art and re incredible effort. Engineering effort is intense to make these work. But that's what uh, engineers do, and uh, they're rewarded for it. Okay, so uh, when the telescope has a resolution, uh, we say it has uh, a resolution that you write this way. Uh, if you take a big telescope and you ask, how, how felt well could you ever see in that telescope? How perfect is it? And the telescope will not image everything to perfection. It is limited by this so-called resolution limit, which is written uh, as proportional to the wavelength of light over the diameter of the telescope. So that means that your res you want this resolution to be very, very s small. You want it to get down to a very small size. And to do that, you want as large a diameter as possible. And you want the wavelength as short as possible. Well, you know, x-rays, you can't use x-rays because they don't make it through the atmosphere. You can't use anything bigger than a 10 meter telescope because it's very hard to build a 10 meter telescope's uh, stiffness behind it. Uh, but you take what you can get and you find that your resolution is generally not this good. With a big telescope, we should have a resolution that would enable us to see uh, incredible precision. For example, if you, one arc second, uh, you're familiar now with seconds, arc minutes, and degrees. One arc second is, is equivalent to holding a quarter at a distance of five kilometers from you. It's, in other words, you have, somebody, have your friend go down to BART and hold a quarter up, and you look at it from uh, top of campus. Okay, can you resolve that? No. You can't generally see that. But you can see about 60 times larger, and that's an arc minute. You can resolve an arc minute, but you cannot resolve an arc second. All right? With, the, with telescopes, we typically want to achieve what we can, and a lot of them uh, do not allow us to see uh, much, much better than an arc second. All right, so here's where it comes in. If you have two objects next to each other, uh, here's one that has a pattern like this. That's, the, that's called the, the diffraction pattern. Uh, everything has, a, has an image that looks like this. You don't usually see these rings, they're really small. But if you have two together, uh, they say, well, you can just barely resolve this. All right, uh, so uh, the smaller the resolution, the more precise you can see uh, everything. All right, so uh, here is, uh, here's the Keck telescopes. Uh, this is the top of Mauna Kea uh, in Hawaii. Uh, over there, this land mass, uh, what's that land mass? Hmm? Maryland. 
No, 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 no. I'm sorry. What is this landmass back here? Anybody? Anybody know Hawaii? Is it a big island? Well, you're on the big island, and you're looking over the ocean. Uh, this is all ocean here to the next island. The next island is, Moloch, is uh, Hana. Uh, um, no. Maui. Maui. Yes, yeah, right. It's Maui. Okay, that's Maui. And uh, the mountain there is uh, Mount uh, Haleakala. Yeah, that's Mount Haleakala. Okay. Uh, all right, errors. Uh, you, you know, when you build imperfect images, <clears throat> you will have the, it will not give you the perfect diffraction limit because polishing the mirrors to the, re the level required is impossible. You just don't do it very well. And you make errors. Uh, you make errors while it's being done, and it's very difficult to do it. And sometimes there are substantial errors. Does anybody remember what happened with the Hubble Space Telescope? Was I don't think any of you were awake then, uh, or were alive. I mean, uh, <clears throat> uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, and then they realized when it was up there that it, it had the wrong figure in the primary mirror. It was perfectly ground to the wrong figure. I said, oh my God, how'd that happen? It was, an engine, it was a, a, a mistake in manufacturing. A mistake in manufacturing spoils a billion dollar instrument. And uh, people said, I can't believe it. The trouble was that this didn't have a close enough coupling between the astronomers and the engineers doing the work. Uh, NASA really screwed up. Uh, they wouldn't let astronomers in there. Anyhow, uh, Hubble got fixed in a year or two uh, when they basically uh, sent up something that gave it a spectacles. It needed, spect it needed glasses. Uh, so they put glasses into the optical system, and it fortunately works. I mean, it would have been terrible for it not to work. All right, so... Uh, all right, the atmospheric uh, seeing, is, which is the motivation for the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, diffraction limits, uh, these are, these are the, the, what causes the imperfect images. All right, now, uh, writing it in a different way, this is putting it in uh, arc seconds. Uh, when we have a D is 10, 10 kilometers, 10 meters, sorry, and lambda is in... Uh, in uh, some unit, uh, we see that the seeing is, do is dominated, the seeing, that is the turbulence of the atmosphere from uh, motion, is a lot higher than the resolution limit. For example, the Keck telescope should, according to, the, to this equation, the Keck telescope should uh, be capable of producing images of one-tenth arc second right away. And yet it never does. It never it has seeing is that good. It's never one tenth arc second. It's more likely one arc second. Why? Well, it could be one arc second because it's not polished right. Uh, errors in the polishing uh, screwed it up. Uh, you know, they might have just made a mistake. Uh, but actually, the the thing that kills the Keck telescope is known as the atmospheric seeing. That is turbulence in the atmosphere as the light comes through. And that is a killer to telescopes, and it can be beat. There's a way it can beat uh, the seeing, but it's very hard work. It's known as adaptive optics. Uh, and let me show you a little bit about that. Uh, OK. Optical window. Uh, here, I'll say that again. Uh, Okay, Here is, uh, here's an example. Here's an image taken with a ground-based telescope. All right, it's a pretty good image. And here's blown up. All right, so we see that it's a little bit round. The spot uh, is a little round here. But if you use a, if you have it with adaptive optics uh, in the system, you can actually see it. this picture turns to this picture. And obviously, the, the later one is better. But how did you do that? 
uh, it, was, it was a magical trick to uh, actually make the atmosphere. You had to measure in about a, a hundredth of a second, you had to measure what the atmosphere is doing and, bound, and have a little rubber mirror that takes out those errors. Incredibly, incredibly fast sensors and electronic systems to make this whole thing work. And it does work. Uh, it's tif difficult, but it does work, and it's the future of astronomy from the ground. Rather than go to all that trouble, people like to put telescopes in space. Right now, they're put, they have the Hubble Space Telescope, but that's past its lifetime, <clears throat> and it's going to be turned off. And the telescope that's replacing it, uh, JWST, is having some political trouble. Uh, the Republicans have killed it in the, in the House. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to die or not, but if it's killed, uh, that's it. You know, we, astronomy can't do much about it, but you, can't, you won't be able to make progress unless, uh, well, you know, it's a big target. Anybody know the, tar the, the semi SSC target? Uh, it was a super collider uh, particle accelerator in uh, Texas. Anybody from Texas? Have you ever seen the SSC? It's a, it's a big system built underground. These tunnels, huge tunnels underground. They had a, they, it was a $10, million, $10 billion project. They had already spent $5 billion, I think. And Congress killed it right in the middle. After they'd already built a lot of stuff. I don't remember where it is. Somewhere, somewhere in Texas. But that's pretty, it's, you know, it's a big state. So, uh, all right, you got to, so it's, you don't know what's going to happen. All right, here's uh, the trouble with atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere will cause the light to, to move a little bit. A pocket of air comes in, and it's a little warmer than the other air. It acts like a little lens, and it causes it to, to move or bend the way a lens would cause something to move. Uh, so it shifts side to side by this, this uh, atmosphere. Or, uh, and the trouble is that the wind moves these pockets. They're not stationary above us. They're moving across by the wind. And it produces an image that are fairly crummy, like that one. Okay, uh, now there's other things that, that uh, really make a difference. For example, this is uh, an issue of spectral resolution. Uh, spectral resolution means, means uh, how fine can you see the differences uh, in wavelength. For example, you have a system that can produce light. It's really pretty fine. Uh, this is uh, 1.54, 0.5, point, 1.55, and you can sort of see that. But if you had a system with a better optics in it, you could disperse the light with finer precision, finer resolution, and turn this into this one. Same object with better resolution. So in astronomy, uh, the uh, optics is uh, constantly something the astronomers are fighting with to try to improve the resolution wherever possible. Okay, so it's, a, it's an engineering problem that can be very difficult. Okay, uh, but if you can make adaptive optics work, you can make beautiful pictures. Uh, for example, here is a picture of Neptune. Uh, Neptune, we'll talk about that more later in, this, in next week. Uh, here is Neptune with clouds uh, wisping around. Here's without adaptive optics. Here you turn the adaptive optics on, and it, wow, it's better. Okay? So adaptive optics uh, magically makes the images better. Uh, but uh, even without it, you can take amazing pictures. Uh, for example, here is the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula is what type of object? Anybody know what the Crab Nebula represents? No, don't say. Anybody know what the Crab Nebula was? Star? Hmm? Star? It's not a star anymore. It was. Well, it was. This is, a, yes. Supernova. Supernova. This star 
uh, was noted by the Chinese astronomers. For some reason, the Europeans have make no note of it. Uh, this thing got as bright as the full moon and blew up one day in the year 1054. Bang, it exploded, uh, and uh, this is what's left. Uh, all right, we'll talk about this later. Uh, this is a very important event. Uh, and this object is exploding. All this gas is expanding. Uh, this is gas of, um, I can't remember what's what here. Uh, all right. Uh, this is gas in, the, uh, for, in oxygen lines. This is gas, uh, the blue is, I can't remember what that is. Anyhow, uh, it's a beautiful object. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like much in a telescope. Anything you can see from here is uh, un not, not up to, certainly not up to this quality. The same teles uh, a telescope in the infrared produces an image like this. Looks kind of unusual, but you, it doesn't bear much resemblance to the first image. If you take an image in the radio region, it uh, again doesn't uh, seem pretty, it seems strange. Uh, the, uh, we'll talk about how the radio emits. Uh, this is, it emits when uh, electrons are moving very fast in the presence of a magnetic field. But, uh, and then this is amazing picture here. We'll see more about this in the course. Uh, this is uh, the Crab Nebula. This is only the central region. And this is actually the thing that powers it. In the center of the Crab Nebula is a neutron star, and we'll talk about what these neutron stars do, okay? How they work. Okay, so with the different wavelengths, you see very different objects, and you learn about uh, the details. Now, uh, if you want to see resolution, uh, you can do, use the following formula. Uh, you can say the resolution is some number times the wavelength of light in nanometers, or a wavelength of light is, say, 500 nanometers, uh, divided by the distance in arc seconds. And the resolution could be uh, arc minutes or whatever. So uh, you can't, you want the resolution to be as good as possible. But if it's limited by uh, the atmosphere, well, you have to find something else. Now, uh, the problem is, you say, well, how the hell does a radio telescope work when, it, uh, when you compare that to the size of an uh, optical telescope? Optical telescope uses very small wavelengths, very small uh, lambdas. Radio telescope will have uh, wavelengths of measured in meters. And how the hell does that ever work? I mean, it's not going to be a uh, superb resolution, you'd think. It's going to be lousy. Except there is a trick. All right, there's a trick. And the trick is to imagine that each telescope is a part of a big telescope. That's all. You just imagine it's part of it. And then you can actually use that. You, this can mathematically be done. Uh, you, uh, the beam comes in here. Uh, it's recorded. It goes down here. And there's delay lines and uh, in-phase delay lines. And uh, it enables you to actually uh, do things with it. Let me show you some examples. This is the VLA, very large array, in New Mexico. It's on the plains of Augustine, I think. You see, there's nothing. Boy, what a barren place. It's incredible. Now, what is this telescope doing? Uh, it is, it's acting as though the whole telescope is as big as this. In terms of calculating the diffraction, the resolution of the telescope is the big one, big telescope. And so this is a technique that is used by radio astronomers to gather fine images. With better resolution, you can see more detail on the object. And so this is used. And there's a lot of electronics uh, in this as well. OK, that's, these are not toys. These are each 25, me 25 meters across, each of these things. They're big. 
Okay, here is the VLA from, from uh, the atmosphere, or a very large array up, up from above it. Uh, the telescopes can be, uh, they're here in a close packed array, that's what it's called. You can spread them out in you know, great distances out here and here and here. These arms can be expanded. And uh, they're expanded once a year or so. And uh, or, Yes? Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be, but uh, they, uh, they want, to, they, if you look at a star and the rotation of the Earth goes a certain time, the rotation of the Earth covers like that, then the star, you've now covered what's called the full UV plane. Uh, you've seen a star or whatever it is from all these angles and you take, put all that information together. It's, uh, it's nice. It's, if you didn't have that, you just had one like this, you'd have good resolution in, the, in this direction and lousy resolution in the other direction. So they want to, they got to do something like that. And by having uh, this way, uh, they only need eight hours to get a good scan. You don't need to scan for 24 hours to complete the scan. Make sense? Okay. All right. Uh, here's VLA again. Uh, people are down here somewhere. Uh, I don't know if that's a person or whatever. Uh, all right. Uh, here again. Uh, all right, now here is uh, a snapshot of uh, the sizes of telescopes. Uh, the Keck telescopes are uh, shown here. This is the telescope owned by University of California, these two telescopes together. Uh, this is owned by, uh, this was polished and owned by uh, University of Arizona. Uh, the, uh, all these over here are in the southern hemisphere. These are all in the northern hemisphere and these are everything we know. Here's Palomar, five meter. It's uh, supplanted by all these new generation telescopes. Okay, so a lot of business in terms of these telescopes. Okay, uh, now here is the Keck telescope again, uh, and uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, here's the control rooms, uh, here's one telescope, there's the other. Uh, they're twin 10 meter telescopes. Uh, we have two of them because uh, the donor for this project, Mr. Keck, uh, had extra money, I guess, and he just gave us a second check for it. I mean, he's only seven, he only paid $100 million for the first one, Second one he got for a mere 70 million, a bargain. Okay? Uh, so if you're ever in Hawaii, you should go up. Because you can, as, a, as an adult, you can uh, have a tour of the telescopes. Okay. Um, uh, here's the largest telescope in uh, the largest refracting telescope. Uh, Okay, uh, here's a lens. Uh, here's another lens for the eyepiece where you, your eye, put your eye there, and that's it. And this is uh, Yerkes Observatory. It's in uh, Wisconsin, southern, uh, southern Wisconsin. It's close to uh, University of California, University of Chicago. Okay. Um, all right, here is a very large telescope. This is a big engineering effort. Here's a person. Uh, this is in the southern hemisphere. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one in the northern hemisphere. This is in Texas. Uh, all right, I'll, uh, the Keck, Hubble. This is the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Uh, this is a telescope in space that images X-rays. How do you image X-rays? Now, if you've ever gone to an, you've all had x-rays taken of you. He holds a piece of film or, or a detector. Nowadays, they, they put a detector behind your mouth or you're getting supposed x-rays of your mouth. Uh, they used to put film back there until recently. Uh, now he puts an electronic sensor back there. And the x-rays shine at you. All right? And then you take an image. 
and you don't, uh, there's no optics in there. It's just shining direct light at you, and the shadow is uh, cast on, on this uh, detector, and that's fine. Now, you think of, of x-rays as being impossible to bend them, but they can be bent. The x-rays can be bent if they pass through a material that is so closely spaced it, uh, it looks like it uh, is an optical material. So closely spaced, the only way you can make something closely spaced is take a piece of optical, let's see the x-ray is coming like this, take a piece of, of uh, material and bend, turn it up this way. So it's almost, the x-ray is coming down and it goes through a whole lot of atoms that are real close together in projection Projection is very close, and that bends it. If you turn it like this, it goes right through. But if you turn it to a steep enough angle, it will refract the light. And for that reason, uh, that's how it works. Uh, inside of here is such a, whoops. Inside of here uh, are cones that are built up uh, of, uh, and they're made of uh, material that is correctly uh, refracting for uh, the x-rays. It's astounding that it works. This thing was really difficult to build. But it, this is uh, something flown by, uh, by NASA. Okay, uh, the GRO, this is something, it's gamma rays, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, uh, several detectors up there. Uh, here is the GRO from above. Uh, the shuttle took this picture. These are uh, detectors here along this and this uh, is sites of, of detectors. This, for the gamma rays, they don't try, they cannot image them. They just uh, detect them straight out. All right, uh, that's not an optical system. Um, here is what the net new generation space telescope will look like someday. Uh, it is amazing construction, if you ever get a chance to read about this. Uh, NGST is now known as JWST, James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, James Webb is somebody, I don't, somebody in NASA, has NASA history. They gave it the name before astronomers could give it its own name. Uh, they beat us to the punch. But anyhow, uh, all right, the telescope. This is a telescope. It's made of several, quite a, about six segments, not the way it's drawn here. And behind it is a blanket. This telescope is always pointed. The telescope does not fly close to the Earth. The telescope flies uh, beyond the Earth, uh, beyond the moon, beyond the point. I'll have to show you later what it is. And the sun has to be in the background, and the Earth is in the background. And uh, they shine light from down below, hit, hits the blanket. The blanket is made of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six layers of material that, uh, that reflect the material, don't let light through, don't let any energy through. And the idea is that this side, the whole front of the thing has to be very cold. It doesn't see light, it has to be cooled down to a Kelvin temperature of 40 degrees just out there in space and it just cools down. And you've got to cool down at the same time that, the op that uh, on the other side of it, back here, it's looking at the sun. And it's hot. So it's got to be cold on one side, hot on the other. This is not a simple job. It's a very complex machine. Incredibly complex. Uh, I'll give you something to read about this. Uh, all right. Uh, all right, here is a telescope that is talked about uh, for uh, the follow-on to the Keck telescope. Believe it or not, this is for real. I, don't, I, I can hardly believe this myself. These are people. That's a, that's a person. And this is something called the California Extremely Large Telescope, CELT. Uh, we'll be the Celtics, I guess. Uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, this thing is three times as big as the Keck telescope. It's ridiculously big. 
And uh, you have to, this thing has to be held incredibly stiffly. You have to hold a uh, secondary mirror up here very well. And uh, this is an engineering monstrosity. Uh, it will be extremely difficult to do this for less than a billion dollars. Okay. It's a lot of engineers involved in this. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Uh, all right. And here, out, what is this? Owl. Overwhelmingly a large telescope. Uh, this, is, this was a dream. Somebody had a dream. This is on the moon, by the way. Anybody want to go and service it? I don't know. That'll cost uh, just a few dollars. Uh, NASA will surely launch that for us. Anyhow, uh, that's an idea. Uh, here is an idea that's really going to happen. This is called the SOFIA Observatory, Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Uh, they've flown this. Uh, here is the device. A 747 has a hole cut out of it right here. And the telescope uh, is put in there. It's, it looks in the infrared region. This thing, the telescope is flying at high altitude, uh, like the 747s do, way above the atmosphere. And you look out through the atmosphere uh, and see what you see. Uh, so the, thing, the device is uh, to be flown out of California, uh, somewhere in Ele uh, on the west on the west coast uh, was it there's a uh, it's uh what's the field to the uh west of us near stanford um, there is a anyhow anyhow they're going they put it there uh is being is built by people here uh parts of it were built here uh et cetera this is real and it's going to happen i think if NASA doesn't fall apart. Uh, here is an instrument. That's something that was flown once. Uh, here is something called the giant binocular Robert Byrd Green Bank Telescope. Uh, this is what uh, Robert Byrd gave us after uh, a big telescope we had there collapsed one day in the wind. It just all it was a nice telescope before and all turned into a heap of metal. Just big crash. And fortunately, nobody got hurt, but he gave us his telescope. Uh, unfortunately, nobody needed it, uh, but we got it anyhow. Uh, and it is, uh, it's in West Virginia, his home state. Uh, here is Arecibo. Uh, Arecibo is very unusual. Uh, it is in a spot in New Mexico. This is in Puerto Rico. Has anybody seen that? What do you think? Yeah, it's really, really big. These are hills uh, in the topography. Uh, these hills are natural. I don't know what the, whether that's. Uh, yeah, it's natural formation. It was a natural bowl uh, that was found is in Puerto Rico in these uh, areas full of hillocks, and uh, they suspended from. Uh, from these sites nearby, uh, they suspend materials. Uh, here is the, the refracting, uh, I'm sorry, this is the secondary mirror, and that's a uh, large telescope. It's 400 meters across, it's huge, just gigantic. A radio telescope. Okay, uh, here are some more radio telescopes. Now, here's a neat telescope as a person. All right, this telescope is filled, as is this one. Here's a person, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. This thing is underground. The previous one was underground. This is in the bottom of a mine. And this is, this is a, uh, this material, here's the astronomer, well, it's physicist here. This whole tank is filled with carbon tetrachloride. Does anybody know what carbon tetrachloride is? Huh? Cl4, uh, carbon, carbon, CCl4. Carbon tetrachloride is cleaning fluid. The whole tank is filled with cleaning fluid. 
That's what it is. The carbon tetrachloride smells a little bit, and it, if you rub it on your clothes, it'll take out whatever's in them. This is, used to be used as, I think it's a dangerous chemical, but anyhow. Uh, what in the hell is all that cleaning fluid doing underground? I mean, there's nothing that has to be cleaned that much. But it's all down there. What's it doing there? All right, we'll talk a little bit about that. This actually is detecting muons. Uh, particles from space come down and uh, hit. They put it underground to get rid of all the junk that's coming with it. And they're trying to filter out uh, the, what they're looking for. And they're looking for a muonic signal. Or actually, no, no, I'm sorry. They're looking for a neutrino signal that would come down and cause something to happen. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, similarly, uh, this telescope Sudbury neutrino detector uh, is huge. Uh, there's one of the workmen uh, right here. This huge, under, under a ton of uh, overburden of stuff. This is way deep in a mine. And the mine, all the ground above it is used to block out all the stuff they don't want to see. They're trying to filter so that the cosmic rays don't get to them. All right. It's incredible. These are all astronomical facilities. Here, here is uh, okay. Now this is a neat device. This is called Super Kamion Kande. It's in uh, Japan. These are all photo tubes. They're big devices that uh, can sense a light flash in there. Now you know what this is here. This is three men in a rowboat, a small rubber dinghy, going around checking the, uh, checking the glass or the sensors in, in one at a time. And then they'll fill up a little more and go up higher, higher, higher. This, is a, this device is a gigantic water tank with very pure water. This is well underground, uh, as well, just like the other things. And it is, uh, detects uh, cosmic rays coming at a certain position, and they can measure them, and they see uh, incredible events. We'll talk about the sort of events you can see with them. It's sort of amazing device in uh, Japan. OK, this is uh, pretty neat. Three guys in a rowboat in the middle of a detector. All right, and we have particles in South Pole. Here's an observatory as well. See? I don't know what they're doing. All right, what are they doing here? Uh, underneath them, there, is, there are cores that are dug three to five kilometers straight down. Straight down cores, and at the end of each core is a region. This is really incredible. These are drawings. That's the Empire State Building for a scale. It goes way down. And uh, it has various detectors in it. This is a device that wants to use the ice in the South Pole as, a refract as an element in a detector. Ice in the South Pole is purified by the pressure above it. It is, uh, does not, it's just a pure ice cube, solid ice cube. And all the bubbles, the air bubbles in ice cubes are gone. It's packed very tight. And this makes it a perfect detector. So they are using that for, for their needs, uh, for various detection. They're looking for high energy particles. Now, in fact, uh, the, in fact the interesting thing is that uh, just think what it uses. Uh, it's in the ice, not too far. You know, it's down a few kilometers. And it wants to block out the earth, uh, the junk coming through the earth. What does it do? It looks not, it's not looking for things coming down through the ice like they were, not coming from here, but it's looking on the opposite side of the earth and uses the entire earth to block the light and then only leave the particles that are left over for them to study. So their primary signal is something upward going, not downward going. It's kind of strange the way this works, but anyhow, that is. That is uh, real. These are all, all astronomical observatories that are used. Here is an event uh, that went up 
Uh, I think it did. And this is, uh, all this was, this is a drawing of the event, and here are lights, are si the processors that went off at a certain time. They went off, snap went off, and uh, tells them a particle came through. So it, the thing works. Okay. Wow. I wasn't paying attention to how much time went by. Uh, but those are some of the amazing, uh, the amazing devices used by astronomers. Uh, and you can see that astronomy, even though it seems like it's a field of no future, uh, is a field that attracts people and attracts people with big instruments. We have, you know, we've got gigantic instruments to enable us to see something. It's not a simple toy anymore. Uh, you use, these things are expensive, obviously, and uh, they will try to talk about what everything is used for. In the, following the course, uh, we'll uh, see what it does. All right, so I'll see you on Thursday. I'll uh, also send that article to you about uh, the uh, JWST.